I have the pleasure to introduce Michal Koslowski, Jan Sova, and Kuba Schroeder on stage. They will talk about their recent work and research on the relation of labor, art, and capital. They will be publishing a book entitled A Joy Forever, Political Economy of Social Creativity, shortly, which will re revolve around these kind of issues and questions. Um, the book documents a conference which you did in 2011 which was entitled Labor of the Multitudes. The three of them are members of the Free Slow University in Warsaw, which is a nomadic center of interdisciplinary studies for critical reflection and independent thinking about art and society. Michal Koslowski is a philosopher. He is a professor at the University of Warsaw. Uh, Kuba Schroeder is an independent curator and a PhD candidate at the Loughborough University. And Jan Sova uh, holds a PhD in sociology uh, and has a habilitation in cultural studies. He's associate professor uh, in the chair of anthropology, literature, and cultural studies at the University in Krakow in Poland. Michal, Jan, and Kuba, alongside Inke, Arns, Thibaut de Reuter, and me, we met in 2012 when we were conceiving the new Industries Festival. I'm really happy to have you back here and welcome to the conference. I'm really looking forward to your contribution. Thanks. Where is the image? Ah, the, the, uh, but then should I? I see the image, but the, the public is supposed no, to see the. No, I don't need this. No. no but what? what to yeah, I, I see. And I, yeah, well, I so I'll just wait, you know, just. Ah, miracle. Yeah, I'm not, you know, that, 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 that's really my, my, my attitude to, to new technologies and new industries. Uh, I'm afraid of them. And so that's why I'm responsible for the bit archaic, uh, would say, uh, historical part. So I'll give a, a very arbitrary historical outline of the problematics of uh, value making and, uh, of, uh, and uh, of the capital, which, which, which we are still facing in a way. Uh, well, I would say, uh, I would start from 18th century, as we usually do you know, in the history of philosophy. So, mm, so the first thing is that the question of the capital was first posed, according to my knowledge, at least in clear terms, by the French physiocrats. So just before, I mean, roughly two dec decades before Adam Smith, uh, precisely put in the terms that capital is a resource, it's a, it's a value, but it's a value in the process of growth. And what was to be explained, what was to be explained was precisely how this growth happens, how this resource is being enhanced, and, and, and you know the, the, the first, the first, uh, the first answer to this question, to be very schematic, the physiocratic answer, the, the Kenet Turgot bunch people, and uh, mercantilists as well, was that uh, it is the earth, it is the, the soil. I mean, it sounds archaic today, but it's not altogether that archaic. I mean, the, the, the idea of um, well, I'll follow up on that. I mean, but clearly the idea that uh, the real productive force is uh, this biological force of the Earth is perhaps not as naive as it seemed directly after, I mean, in, in 19th century. Uh, well, this theory, of course, is almost immediately criticized by the classical economy, by Smith, Ricardo, and, uh, which, uh, uh, and Locke, one um, Locke, Locke, perhaps the most important author here, because he was the first one to, sh to say that it was a really a tricky issue. The first thing was to say, no, land is of no value. The value, um, well, or value of land is infinitely low. So it is there, but it's infinitely low because it's labor that yields crops. And labor produces value. I mean, it was a very tricky argument because on the one hand, it, it had a very simple ideological function, which is clear in Locke himself, that actually when we are stealing land, from North American natives or from whomever, whomever else, actually we are not stealing anything. We are stealing the value, infinitely small value, because they cannot work, they cannot provide their labor, so we are more legitimate, because anyway we are producing value, because we labor that land, we cultivate it. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, uh, this first generation, 
Locke, namely but Ricardo also, they completely overlooked the little political detail that the wealth in England that was getting wealthy at the very time, at the very moment, uh, in this very England, the wealth doesn't belong to the ones who work, mostly. So, I mean, this, this was the way paved for, uh, for Karl Marx, uh, uh, quite open. Uh, but then, of course, what, yet another thing from the classical economy, um, cl classical economics, was that they were in a very ambiguous and rather critical uh, uh, relation to Malthusian theories. You know, Malthusian theory was supposedly the most, uh, the most, uh, the, the 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 single the single theoretical formula which killed the biggest number of people supposedly because it just considered that uh, the progress of um, the progression of the food production is uh, is arithmetic while uh, the progress the population grows unless war, famine, or something like that, is geometrical. So we will never feed humanity, which, is, which also means that states or states must have policies of reducing populations, right? I mean, so this was, a, and this was until the 19th century, it was a public opinion dogma, more or less. Uh, so Lockeans, Ricardians were not happy with this at all. Uh, then, uh, uh, yeah, please help yourself. Uh, well, and, 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 then, and then, of course, ca comes Karl, Karl, Karl Marx, who has, I would say, the complete uh, definition of what is the capital. Because, because Marx says like that, uh, well, of course, capital is, is a resource in the process of growth. But this resource is about the social relation. So this, is re this resource is relational. It is labor, of course, but this labor is a collective labor. It's always the labor in, in, in relation. And, and, then, and then thirdly, supposedly the, the most important uh, theoretical contribution of Marx, the surplus value. The surplus value, which means that this relation in, in which the capital happens, uh, this relation is by its very essence the relation of dispossession and privation of the other. So one is benefiting and other is not. And this is, this is, in, uh, this is more or less the, 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 the hardcore of capitalism. Uh, okay, where am I? What do I have to finance? Okay, and, and in, 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 in this sense, of course, Marx had, uh, well, th it can be debated, but mostly Marx in this respect was an economist. So he addressed what we would call today a material economy with this, with this issue. We know that there is this famous sentence about fet uh, uh, commodity fetishism in, in the, the, famous, the famous phrase in Marx. But actually, even if it inspired a lot the 20th century, 20th century cultural Marxism, this, this is not particularly developed in Marx, if at all, right? Mm. I would say, of course, then after Marx comes the, I would say the, the, what, what I can identify, we can identify as the birth of sociology or the birth of social science, which ha happens simultaneously almost in France and in Germany with, uh, uh, with Durkheim and uh, Weber. And, uh, but they have a bit different, they both in a sense criticize Marx, that he was only focused on the division of labor and he didn't understand enough the religious dimension of the society. Religious didn't, uh, didn't imply here any transcendence. I mean, it's completely secular thought. So, so both, both Durkheim and Weber, they work on this idea that there is the division of labor as a, as a sort of one order, and the other order is the order of right, belief, distribution of the symbolic order. And of course, they are influencing each other, but this, the, there is no overdetermination one, by one over, over the other. Huh? Uh, but I think that the real, that the real, the real, what we thought was a real revolution in thinking of value making, creation of value and the capital was, uh, and I think we still confront this problem. And I think this problem was first emerged, or, or at least was named by Marcel Mauss in his, uh, in his very famous essay, Essay sur les dons. So it is translated to, to English as, as the gift, I think, simply. Uh, where he said, well, there is a different economy. It, there is, it, there, it exists an economy of symbolic goods and symbolic exchange. And this symbolic exchange is structured completely differently 
uh, from what we pictured as economy. So there is alternative economy. And, 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 and of course, he, he, of course, the potlatch was in the center of it, right? And, uh, and, and, and even Moss already said, I'm quoting Moss here, dangerous gift economy encumbered by personal considerations incompatible with the development of the market, trade, and productivity. In, in a world, it is uneconomic. So the symbolic economy is uneconomic in, in the terms of contemporary economics. Uh, from there, no wonder, very quickly, we have this, and we have this reappropriation of Mossian paradigm by radical social critique. I mean, I think Georges Bataille was, was here, the, the, the first one, to discover then the economy of the gift, the potlatch, but not only him. If you look at surrealists, then you, especially letterists and situationists, and the, the potlatch review, and still the idea that we should, we should oppose symbolic economy to this material capitalistic economy and make a sort of uh, symbolic economy triumph. Well, uh, and now I'll be heading towards an end to, 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 for, for you to continue, but I would say, I mean, this is precisely the problem that this hope of ours has vanished, in a way. Now, we know pretty well, uh, Janek found out that it, for the first time the, 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 the concept of cultural capital was used by completely unknown, uh, social capital, social capital was discovered by uh, some completely unknown American sociologist in 1916, but definitely it was elaborated fully by Pierre Bourdieu. It exists to some extent in Baudrillard. I mean, we can appreciate to what extent symbolic economy is also based on the capital, on this very same relation that deprives the other. The economies of prestige, of legitimacy, are no, not more innocent than traditional economic capital with its exploitation. So perhaps uh, symbolic economy would be a solution, but not any. Uh, we would need to sort of invent an uh, emancipatory one, which doesn't seem much easier task than inventing uh, uh, equi equity or egalitarian material economy. So, yeah. Mm, okay, I will, I will stop here and I... Now you. Huh? Thanks. Uh, I will start by, I will mainly focus on the myth of art worker. I will try to uh, somehow criticize this uh, notion that uh, cultural producers are workers in the same sense as uh, factory workers. However, uh, regarding this new industries, I will start by referring to the very term cultural or creative industries. It's really interesting to see the historical evolution of this term, because it was coined in a very critical context by uh, Frankfurt School uh, philosophers, uh, who are saying the fact that culture is becoming a kind of industry is horrible and utterly deplorable. And now it's being used in an affirmative way, yes? How great that culture is an industry. Uh, I think this ironic twist is completely uh, f forgotten. People who use cultural industries in positive terms, they don't even know about the critical origin of this term. However, what is interesting is that both critical and affirmative perspectives, they uh, create this link between uh, a factory worker and cultural worker, right? We could say culture is just, uh, I don't know, a gallery, or art institution is just a different kind of factory, right? Producing different kind of goods or, or merchandise. Uh, in the uh, context of visual arts, the, 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 the term, term art worker, of course, is uh, uh, immediately associated with Art Workers Coalition from uh, 1969 uh, that had a very critical, good critical and emancipatory uh, intent, right? Let's uh, value more the creative work because actually the creative work is like the uh, actual work in the uh, in the factory my main point here is that there are workers in the field of visual arts or in general in cultural productions uh, but not uh, uh, not all agents in this field, yes, I'm referring here to this b b concepts of Bourdieu, not, agent, not all agents in these fields are workers. And particularly, my main point is that artists are not workers. 
they are a sort of a different, completely different position that uh, cannot be directly mapped to this classical division, right, into three types of, of uh, positions or uh, that relate to source of income, right? We have capitalists and their source of income is profit, right? What they invested and what they, what they get back, uh, thanks of course to exploitation. Uh, we have, on the other hand, we have uh, proletariat, right? People who are waged. So their source of income is wage. And we had the third category, I think it's very interesting. Uh, these are the rentiers, right? People who uh, derive rent from some kind of property. Let's say you have a chunk of land and you, uh, somebody uh, is uh, uh, renting this land uh, from you, right? So you receive a certain dividend from this, uh, uh, from this land. Or you have some other kind, you have a flat. Right? and you rent this flat. So what you receive is a rent. It's a sort of passive income that you get from something you own. Uh, when we look at artists, definitely artists, well, one of the reasons why it's, it's wrong to call artists workers is that definitely artists in the field of visual arts are not employed, right? In other fields of cultural productions, they are. You have musicians working like waged uh, in, in Philharmony. You have actors in a theater. The field of visual arts is, is different. You don't have people who are employed by any kind of institution, private, public, NGO, anything, to be artists, right? They function in a different way, but this is actually, this is not the main, uh, uh, the main problem here. Uh, my point, so if artists are not workers, so what, what are they? I would say they are a sort of very strange hybrid of entrepreneurs and rentiers. Why are they entrepreneurs? Uh, I will refer here to this uh, uh, idea of forms of capital that was introduced by, uh, by Michal in his talk. Uh, actually, what artists need to do for their career to progress is to manage various types of capital and to somehow manage to convert one capital into another. Right? So uh, you have social capital, and social capital is your place in the network of uh, connections, people you know, people you worked with, people who know your work, right? Uh, look at the importance of networking and social life in the field of visual uh, arts, right? It would be very difficult to point out uh, 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 an important artist or curator who has never ever networked it, right? Of course, if you achieve a certain position where you don't need to, you know, go to the openings, talk to the people, uh, uh, get curators to know your work, you can function without this. But to progress in this field, to make a career, you need to do networking. What is networking? Networking is accumulating social capital. What artists then do is to convert the social capital into other forms of capital, right? Sometimes it's material capital, it's money, right? They are known, so they are invited, and they can be paid for what they do. Sometimes it's a, a, a capital like a symbolic capital, prestige, right? So they are invited to take part in exhibitions or some events that are not... Uh, uh, source of material uh, income, however, they provide them opportunity to do important things, to, to show their work in an important uh, uh, context, right? Uh, uh, artists need to, uh, need to accumulate symbolic capital, right, by cooperating with good curators, uh, being exhibited in important galleries. Uh, it's interesting if we look at the link between public institution and art market. Right? Uh, a solo exhibition in an important uh, artistic institution, public institution, translates directly into the price of artists' work on the, or the, on the art market. And uh, this is being exploited by people who uh, organize various kinds of events as saying to the artists, okay, we cannot pay you a lot, but you do the work and later you can sell it, right? If you take part in this exhibition, you will get more money for your, uh, for your work. This is the moment of conversion of, uh, of, uh, of capital. Uh, and of course, also, uh, artists get some material capital from their activity. These are directly financial gains uh, from, uh, from uh, 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 various kinds of uh, uh, things that they, they do, right? So. Uh, it's, it's a, a kind of economy of prestige that translates into, uh, uh, into money, right? We know the situations. I think all of you who have some experience uh, uh, working in the, uh, in the field of cultural production, you know the situation when you are invited to take part in a project. You are paid in a very, very poor way or even not paid at all. However, you're being told this is prestigious, right? So this situation when you are 
in this kind of uh, trade between prestige and money, this is precisely the moment when you convert capitals. Uh, so uh, I, I would like to do two addi uh, additional remarks here. Uh, first, of course, we could criticize this uh, approach saying uh, uh, this is another uh, incarnation of Homo economicus. Uh, Kuba is going to talk more about Homo economicus. I will just briefly refer to this. Uh, this, ca this kind of calculation is not necessarily conscious. Right? Homo economicus, the idea of Homo economicus implies that we are all rational subjects who calculate in a conscious way what we do and we always choose the best option. Here we are rather in the situation of classical meaning of ideology as we find it in Marx, when Marx says they do not know what they do, yet they are still doing this. So this is a kind of, it does not need to be a conscious, you know, uh, uh, thinking what now, what I'm going to do, am I going to take part in this or in that, uh, not necessarily conscious. It can be a sort of, a, uh, to, to refer to different terms, uh, Bourdieu is talking about habitus, a certain way we act, and he's saying this is a practical sense. It does not need to be deliberately stated and described in our own consciences. We just act like this. So as I said, every situation when you are in, this, uh, uh, in front of this trade, not paid but prestigious, and if you decide to do it, then you act precisely as an entrepreneur who is trying to invest his or her time into accumulating one form of capital to be able to translate it into different form of capital later on. It can be unconscious. Another thing is I don't want to confuse this idea of entrepreneurialism with neoliberal idea of entrepreneur uh, for two basic facts. First of all, neoliberal understanding of entrepreneur is limited to material dimension. This is what we are being told all the time. You have to uh, uh, be entrepreneurial in order to earn more money, to make more success in purely material uh, terms. I'm not referring here at all to this material level. Material is just one form of capital. Capital understood as a resource, but also as a social relation, because all other forms of capital that uh, Bourdieu talked about, uh, cultural capital, uh, uh, symbolic capital, social capital, they can only be, also be described as social relations and not uh, only uh, resources. Another thing is that neoliberalism is focused on this managerial idea. You have to be a manager of yourself, right? And it's also very normative. I'm not being normative here. I think it's rather uh, the fact that uh, artists need to be entrepreneurs is, an, uh, is a byproduct of the situation that they are not employed. And I don't think it's a good thing. I, I, I'm, I'm not postulating more entrepreneurialism. I'm just trying to describe the positions that artists uh, uh, have. Now the second uh, component, rent. This is very, very interesting because Marx believed that rent is going away. That rent was a part of feudal uh, uh, economy, that with development of capitalism, everything is going to turn into this uh, bipolar, either you're a, a owner of the means of production, so you have profit, or you are uh, uh, deprived of a means of production and the source of your income is wage. Right? So he thought with time it's going to, 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 to be like this. We can see very well that this is not happening. There's a great uh, um, article by uh, Italian economist and, and philosopher Carlo Vercellone. He's talking about rent becoming of profit. So he's showing how in uh, uh, most advanced areas of capitalist production, like financial markets, like uh, uh, IT sector, uh, income is much more like rent than a profit. And of course, intellectual property is one of very good uh, examples, right? The income derived from intellectual property, it's not a profit, it's not a wage, it's a rent. It's just that it's rent that is derived from immaterial possessions. Not material like a flat or a, a piece of land, but immaterial ones. There's also another very interesting analysis that was done by uh, Immanuel Wallerstein, and he's showing that actually, uh, despite all this ethics of uh, work and uh, 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 entrepreneurialism and so on that capitalists uh, are so keen to repeat, the way they behave is rather they try to imitate the aristocrats. So once uh, every capitalist, if, if he or she has got opportunity, would like to turn his or her source of income into rent not to be uh, uh, obliged to invest anymore, not to be obliged to compete and so on, uh, just to derive profit from something that was already uh, done uh, before. And of course, this defense of uh, culture, of uh, intellectual rights, copyrights, property, and so on, this is a very good example, right? I want to derive income infinitely as a sort of rent from something that was done uh, in the past. So why artists are uh, rentiers? What do they own? What do they own? They own their own names as a sort of brand, 
right? So this is very interesting because this is a, a sort of immaterial property uh, and it allows them to get more material or any other forms of capital from their activity as compared to somebody who doesn't have this, uh, this name, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, their names, you can say, function as a kind of uh, machines, precisely in the Lesian terms that uh, Matteo Pasquinelli was uh, the, uh, referring to. Uh, their names, their identities, they sh uh, function as a sort of machines in terms that they uh, moderate, manage, and manipulate the flows of various forms of capital. Right? Uh, it's, it, in this way, uh, well, we, we know the situations when, for instance, uh, you know, uh, you go to your friend's place, you take their garbage, you put it into a transparent aquarium, and you want to exhibit it. If you are Arman, you'd probably get a lot of money, a lot of recognition for this. Just because you are Arman, because he did this before, right? And we know the strategy of repeating the same kind of tricks than somebody did in, in the future, and he or she can only do it because he or she has got a copyright, their name, their name associated with this action, and this produces additional, uh, additional value. Uh, uh, this is very different from the position of workers, right? Because uh, if, if you're a worker in a, uh, in a factory, then definitely you do not accumulate any sort of immaterial capital because of your name. You're paid just for what you do and not for who you are, for, for your name. You know, it's the same thing of, uh, I don't know, you're invited to a, co it, it's not unique for the art field. You can say in a, uh, uh, in a field of knowledge, it's somehow uh, similar, right? If you have, a, uh, uh, I don't know, if you're called Zizek or Badiou, then you get 5,000 euros for uh, giving a, a public lecture, right? Uh, if you're not, you may say the, the equally interesting things, but you're paid less, right? So it's just your name, you can derive a kind of rent from your, uh, just from having your name, your identity uh, recognized. Uh, um, and also, of, of course, another dimension is copyrights and deriving profit from copyrighted, uh, uh, copyrighted uh, work, right? Uh, and this uh, exigency of uniqueness uh, uh, that, that functions quite, uh, it's, it's quite strong in the, uh, in the field of visual art, it helps to uh, to further this situation, right? You have to do a unique thing, something different from somebody else. What somebody else did is associated with his or her name, and only he or she can derive profits from, from this. If you repeat the same gesture, then you're just an imposter. You're not only not paid or recognized, you're even disqualified for doing, uh, for doing this, right? If uh, workers, it's a completely different thing. If one worker uh, invites a trick to work in a more efficient way, and another worker copies this, he or she is rewarded for this and not punished. So this is a completely different uh, uh, situation. Uh, so uh, a conclusion, a sort of a general, uh, uh, what kind of uh, also political conclusions we can derive from this. Uh, as I said, there are workers in the field of visual arts, for instance, assistants, coordinators, technicians, and so on. But artists in this field, they are not workers. The art worker is a sort of myth. Uh, of course, I'm not denying here exploitation of creative work. Of course, there is an exploitation of creative work. What, however, I would like to uh, uh, point your attention to is that there's also an exploitation going on within the field of art. And this is also a sort of a, a class conflict, right? I would put this in, in, uh, in quotation marks. It's not a class conflict in the, uh, in the, in the sense that Marx was using this term, but uh, there is a, definitely a division of labor that, it, that uh, translates into some kind of uh, uh, um, uh, exploitation, right? This is a very similar diagnosis to what Christopher Newfield did regarding the so-called cognitariat, right? He wrote this great text, it's called The Structure and Silence of the Cognitariat, and he shows that there are core workers in the cognitariat who produce copyrighted uh, 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 products or copyrighted results. And they are the core workers, they are well paid, uh, they can really get a lot from their work. There is also a sort of peripheral workforce in, in Cognitariat. These are those who only manipulate the symbols, right? So they are a sort of a cannon fodder of, uh, of cognitive uh, uh, capitalism. And this is a kind of division that we could see in the uh, 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 field of visual arts uh, as well. That's all, thank you. Uh, now it's uh, Kuba. Thanks, Janek. Thanks, Michał. 
Uh, maybe at the beginning, just still a couple of words of, uh, of uh, this general introduction about Frislow University. Uh, it's very important to kind of emphasize that we do not uh, present a kind of like united form, so we are uh, three guys and come usually and talk a lot. However, um, there is, let's say, this kind of like more and more Bourdieuian or sociological or let's say a um, suspicious type of analysis like Janek presented, which basically shows how all these anti-economical or seemingly kind of generous uh, strategies in the art world, how they are undermined by certain type of economies, right? And then, however, the, the whole free flow of university is uh, really started from more kind of Walter Benjamin's idea from 1930s, in which he said in his quite famous essay of author as a producer, and this is actually the real start of his art workers, let's say, uh, thinking, that this is, uh, if you want to kind of like um, analyze the political stance of the author, it's not enough to take a look at what he says about the relation of productions of his period, but you need to take a look at how he stands inside of these relations of production. And this is the first step to actually uh, kind of transform artists or like an author into a producer and kind of link his case uh, with the case of uh, proletariat. At least this was the kind of like Benjamin's uh, idea in 1930s. Now it is, of course, much more complicated. And this kind of like zone of complication is where uh, Freestyle University operates. Um, because it's, of course, in, a, in, a, uh, in today's, it's not just enough to say that artists are producers, because as Janek, uh, Janek and Michał said, uh, artists are producers of the very, very specific type. And this initial program of Benjamin also did not really work out as Benjamin has intended. And um, what I want to talk about, and another thing is with uh, Free Slow University, is that we are not taking this position of uh, kind of uh, distant sociologists towards the field in which somebody else operate. We operate from inside the field. So we are kind of implicated, at least uh, for me it is, uh, um, it is much more uh, clear than for some others, but we operate with uh, the Benzmiana Foundation, we operate from inside of grant systems, we operate somehow as part of the art field. We are all authors in our own rights, so we do publish, we are, uh, we are partaking in the economy, in the symbolic economy, uh, and in the economy of publishing. We are ranked, we rank, and uh, we do compete. And uh, this is, uh, so if we are talking about different entrepreneurial strategies, it's not that somebody else does it, but at least I think that we are all somehow, and when I'm talking all, I'm not talking only about us three, but we are all, if we are authors or we, if we are part of the art field, somehow we are implicated in it in one way or another. And my question is, from which position can we be implicated in this kind of co uh, competitive um, um, economy? Here what you can see is, uh, is like to uh, just show you an example of how, uh, how this operates. Here, as you can see, is this uh, uh, book of ours, or a cover, which will be published by Mayfly, not Myfly. This is a very important, Armin is there, thank you Armin for, for your help. It will, be, uh, it will be ready to be downloaded in a, a couple of uh, weeks or months from a Mayfly as a uh, free to download uh, kind of like publication as a PDF. But why do I uh, uh, talk about it? The conference on which we based this publication was called the Labor of the Multitudes with a Question Mark. However, what you can see here are clearly named individuals. Right, this is our cover. And of course, when it comes to any kind of publishing situation, we usually have to name somebody who is somehow authoring a given type of text, symbol, whatever else. And then we are implicated in all these reput reputational economies about which uh, Matteo uh, talked before. These economies are of course different and they are kind of like ruptured and not necessarily create one convergent system. So they might be a bit more informal in the uh, art world. Uh, they might be a bit more formalized in the academy. However, they still based on this kind of attribution between the text and the person and what is very important, distribute rewards according to, this, uh, uh, to the position in the network or in the hierarchy. And, um, and then 
the question, my question is, what is the relationship between these individuals and the kind of like multitudes or underlying circuits of uh, social production? As we are uh, saying here, like the social creativity was a kind of theme of, uh, of, a, uh, of the conference. And from which kind of, um, what kind of stance or what kind of strategy do we employ when we uh, do operate in it? Uh, what I think is quite important for the Free Slow University of Warsaw is to, and I think also for all of us, uh, in a sense, uh, especially for, uh, for Free Slow University, for our members, but I guess that as we are here and as a kind of critical practitioners, is to rather employ strategies which would be of a kind of, let's say, in a game theory, cooperative nature. Or like uh, which, would, uh, which would somehow operate with some sort of common interest in mind or at least uh, which would uh, understand interest, not in a very narrow sense of, a, uh, of the short-term self-interest, but rather have in mind all the other people who are implicated, or at least, of course, not all the other, like in a sense of humanity, but at least circles of people who are somehow uh, implicated in our given situation. Uh, what, uh, because uh, what we need to um, understand, or what we actually all know, more or less on a uh, conscious or subconscious level, is that we are living in an extremely unequal uh, um, economy, this is one thing, and also in a field which is ridden, especially art field, by extreme level of inequalities. So though, and this is like the quite interesting situation, because though we have all these entrepreneurial people who are like competi kind of competing, let's say, according to some model with each other, all in all, at the end, we have a winner's take all situation, or like what Hans Abin calls cruel economy of the arts, in which majority of us are poor. Or at least, like, not such a lot of, uh, not such a majority of people who are competing in this kind of situation are rather precarious, uh, uh, kind of like dark matter of the art world uh, than, the, um, than the kind of like small, tiny minority of, uh, of artistic celebrities. And, um, and then, um, <clears throat> and this is kind of like making even problematic why do we, why do, we do it? How, do, how, how does it happen that all of us kind of invest in a system or like are invested in a system which at the end uh, uh, makes majority of us um, poor? And here I think it is important to get into, uh, into neoliberalism as both an ideology and a kind of like real existing system. Uh, as an ideology, in the, not, not in the sense of uh, Michal, but rather as some sort of like, uh, let's say, apparatus or mechanic type of, uh, of setting, uh, which implies our own personality or like which involves our own personality, how we do think about ourselves and about the others in which there was this idea that competition was somehow uh, was related to the meritocracy and it will lead to the kind of like that the uh, merging of effort and talent uh, will end up in a kind of uh, um, justifiable or, or justified or legitimate uh, spread of resources between, between people or like spread of let's say limited uh, amount of resources between people who do uh, compete or who, who, who are kind of like partaking in a game. So as an ideology, and I think this, this is in a kind of like art field, it is very, uh, very well rooted currently because it also somehow related to the romantic idea of the individual talent or like in, in science also to like some kind of like outer responsibility for your own work or this strong uh, individualistic tendencies uh, in both uh, fields in which authoring was usually understood as individual act of doing things rather than some sort of derivate of the social cooperation. Somehow it got uh, very absorbed in, a, um, in our mindsets. And uh, then in a real existing neoliberalism, um, it created certain systems and like uh, ranking agencies, not necessarily even institutions, but rather ways how to distribute resources in which uh, uh, competitive strategies, which are aimed at kind of like maximizing your own benefit in a short-term perspective, are the ones which seem most rational, or the ones which seem to be inavoidable, at least when you want to get by or if, if you want to even uh, survive in a daily um, existing uh, situations. 
However, and this is very, very important, usually these competitive strategies uh, are based on a certain type of uh, freeloading or exploitation because they are always underlined by a strongly cooperative systems uh, which, uh, uh, which make it all uh, function. So both, let's say, on the level uh, of the uh, network and on the level of, of particular projects, usually we, have a, uh, we, we can see a, a kind of like a mixture of uh, co cooperation and competition, or a kind of certain type of competition, in which, um, in which cooperative strategies are necessary for all this, like a kind of like certain type of interdependence, of this kind of like uh, gifts of sociality are necessary for certain systems to, uh, to operate. However, very frequently, uh, in this kind of systemic setting, the um, opportunities, the rewards, are distributed on an individual level. So if we have any kind of artistic project, it's usually a certain type, especially in a kind of like freelance situation, it's a kind of marvel of cooperation. Different people come together, uh, there is a certain division of labor, however, the hierarchies are usually quite flat if you compare it especially to a regular institutional uh, setting in the sense of a corporation, something like that. Uh, you might have a leader of the project, you might have people who are more like assistants. However, usually they do play different roles in it. They are like uh, the, and also what is very important, that because of multiple job holdings, a person who is in one project, an assistant can be an artist in the other and manager in the, uh, in the other one. That happens quite, uh, quite frequently. And they do cooperate because oh, the whole team has to achieve a certain type of, uh, of uh, have to succeed in certain type of, um, enterprise or like um, have to manage with this and uh, and the kind of like and if they do not cooperate they will definitely uh, fail but then after this uh, after this project after any kind of project is finished in this kind of like flexible uh, environment everyone uh, moves to the next one not as a team but as an individual and your kind of like the next opportunity to uh, to get a job to get uh, to get an opportunity to, to do anything depends on your own individual uh, uh, profile or your own position in a, um, uh, in a uh, reputational ranking. So of course it creates a situation in which uh, the group of people work but only a couple of them later on because of the success of this, uh, of this uh, project it will be attributed in a different uh, ways to the different people who t partake in a project from different positions. So, for example, if somebody is a famous artist and makes a, uh, makes a uh, project, there is a chance that some other people, that he will be mentioned in press reviews, that he will be, uh, or she will be uh, somehow, um, yeah, that the kind of like success of this will be attributed. Like the same is with curators, they're also having certain type of relationship between their persons and their projects, or their, uh, their individual profiles and projects. However, if somebody is an assistant, you might maybe get a job uh, afterwards. But there is a chance that you will get another job as an assistant. So this kind of like differences are becoming replicated uh, when people move between uh, between the projects. So there is this kind of like class in what Yannick said about this, or like or like this system of differentials uh, between different type of positions, between support and authorial, between individual and kind of like uh, between visible and invisible, uh, which uh, somehow manages these transitions. And there is a strong competition to actually get into a position which enables you to to um, make a new uh, venture, or venture into something uh, from a uh, proper, um, from a pro proper kind of, with a proper sort of portfolio. And another one, uh, like let's say in the network, on the level of a network, there is another important set of a cooperative and competitive uh, uh, pressures or strategies. Because network on the one hand operates only because people are freely sharing their own uh, uh, their own ideas, or like uh, the ideas have to flow. The network is generally based on the velocity of uh, of communication, and in uh, such an environment, it is in, in, important that people connect, that people exchange, that people are somehow uh, linked, or that they do cooperate. Not necessarily thinking about whether the given moment will bring some sort of like uh, result in uh, uh, in the future. However, in uh, all in all, it creates a winners take all economy uh, in which only uh, very few individuals uh, do uh, have a chance to announce their ideas or like attribute certain type of concepts, ideas and notions to themselves and be accepted as this kind of announcers. Uh, so uh, in a sense, there is this um, 
And there is this uh, uh, moment of when somebody says, uh, writes a text or, or makes a piece, and out of this whole uh, bunch of concepts, he says, okay, so this is uh, somehow, uh, somehow, this is what I think, and presents uh, what is generally available as, uh, as authorial idea, and based on this, is ranked, and depending where it is said, and who, say, who says it, and, uh, and, and who hears it, uh, uh, the distribution of rewards is also dependent on this, and there is a strong competition to get into these positions, which has the strongest visibility, let's say, or there is this ranking or like a, a ranking or hierarchy of uh, prestige and attention. Okay, so I think that I need to finish because it's already, uh, I'm already exceeding my time. However, I think that this is interesting from this perspective of, uh, of competition and cooperation to rethink notions like uh, the commons, and uh, not from a perspective of a kind of like idealized, uh, idealist, uh, idealized vision of, of commons as some sort of like general reservoir, but to rather really think about how to defend communities of commoners or communities of people who do have some sort of common interest in mind from freeloaders and from people who uh, pursue mainly their own uh, narrow interests. Thanks a lot for your contributions. We would, would like to open up. Uh, you are invited to ask questions. If you have any questions, please, or remarks, comments, you're invited to ask them. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your triple A talk. Um, I have two questions, one to Michal and one to Jan. Um, Michal, um, the uh, modern economy is very close to the uh, motion uh, example of the economy of the gift because money circulates, it creates a community, but this does so in a much more uh, vertical than horizontal way. Um, uh, André Orléans has described this very well when he says how the whole pension systems link one generation uh, to the other and uh, he finishes with the sentence that we believe in money or in the currency we are using because we die. So you have the whole uh, business which most described on a vertical basis, you have it from one generation uh, to the next. And I think it's just enlarging a bit what you were saying. And the same applies to uh, Michal of trying to enlarge what, uh, uh, to, to Jan, sorry, of what you were uh, trying to say. Um, the artist that works in his own or her own name comes at a period when the free market economy slowly uh, comes into, into being in some countries like the Netherlands a bit earlier, in other countries a bit uh, later. And it's from then on that you have the speculation on art too, that art sometimes even becomes a new form of currency. But what happens if you have speculation is that the renting business moves over to the owner and does not necessarily stay with the artist uh, himself. And I think uh, you're perfectly right in what you describe, but I think we have to add this part to it too, that the rent business maybe gets out of hand for the artist and moves over to those who speculate with art itself. Well, I, I will start, thank you. Uh, well, I, I, if, if I read your question well, it is uh, about does it make sense today to distinguish really uh, this material and symbolic or non-material, which is more the term of today, um, economies. Well, that's a, I, I think, well, an absolute, of course, even in Bourdieu, they are convertible. The capitals of the symbolic capitals are convertible but under certain conditions in a given circumstances. It's not a nomadic. And I think that the both levels still uh, preserve a certain degree of, of, of autonomy. The good example is the intellectuals and artists who, ha as Bourdieu put it, they are the part of the dominant class deprived of the ec most of economic fruits of domination, which unfortunately is, <laughs> but otherwise they are dominant. So of course it's not that, uh, it's not that obvious, but I, I, I think, well, I would say, for me the question is, when I try to, 
explain it to myself, does it make sense? I think that it's really impossible to tell. But it, it categorically, to, 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 to keep those categories separated, at least for the purpose of research, is it's important. Because when you answer, ask the question, do the rich people eat better food? Or is the be food better because it's eaten by the rich? It's so difficult to answer this question empirically. Really, I mean, it is. I mean, there are ways to approach it, but it's very difficult. Uh, yeah, it's a really very interesting phenomena you're talking about, uh, uh, which uh, uh, again uh, creates some similarities or points to some similarities, be similarities between culture and the most advanced sectors of capitalist production or capitalist economy, like financial markets. Uh, the uh, um, market value of Facebook is $100 billion. This does not correspond to the assets of this company. It does not correspond to the actual product that it makes. It corresponds to a collective work of a multitude of users, precisely what uh, Matteo was, uh, was talking about. Now, this value is represented or captured by financial market, right? Financial market is not producing this value at all, does not uh, contribute to this production. So what you're talking about, this transfer of ownership from artists to different kind of owners, speculators, collectioners, but uh, also people who buy art for investment uh, sake. This is a kind of, and, and also the link between art market and public institutions, that art market is not an autonomous uh, circle. You, it would be, uh, uh, you, you can very well show that uh, uh, artists who are active in the public sphere, they get more money from selling their work on the, on the market. And, and as I said, exhibition, an important public gallery, is a, a, a method to boost up the market value. So this is precisely this moment of capture. The art market is not producing this value, it's rather capturing the cultural value that's being produced in other uh, circuits or in a uh, uh, sort of interaction between different kinds of, uh, of, of circuits. So uh, it's, it is there this, uh, this, this, this mechanism of capture and it's, it's, it's really uh, interesting to see how it works. Uh, in, in the book that we're going to, to publish, Luke Boltanski wrote a, a great text precisely about uh, this, how we can see, what kind of similarities we can see between culture and uh, art and financial uh, capitalism. And it, it goes farther than, than only capture, but capture is one of the important uh, dimensions. Any other questions or comments? No? Okay. If you let me, I just have a quote uh, to the question that uh, Kuba asked to ourselves. Why do we get, why do we play the game at the same try, time trying to denounce the game? I think I have a beautiful uh, quote from Bourdieu, from his book on, on Pascal. Well, it's not really on Pascal, it's an homage to Pascal. Rather. It's, no, it's not Chairman Mao this time. No. Uh, the original investment has no origin because it always precedes itself and and when we, deliberate, uh, when we deliberate on entry into the game, the die is already more or less cast. We are embarked, as Pascal puts it. To speak of a decision to commit oneself to scientific or artistic life, as in any other of the fundamental investments of life, vocation, passion, devotion, is, as Pascal himself was well aware, almost as absurd as evoking a decision to believe in God. Well, that's <laughs> I don't know if that's explained anything, but... <laughs> no, it just explains what you're just told you. Nothing. You're going to publish the book the PSD, right? No. Uh, no. Uh, no, 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 no. It's, we are edit co-editors. There's five people who edited the, uh, uh, the, book. the book. Three of us, and Agnieszka Kuh and yes, Christian Szatkowski who are not here. Right. And there are like uh, the 16 or 17 authors. And of course, there is, uh, you know, like multiple people who, uh, multiple people who also work from um, behind the scenes. Let's say, like I talked about, I mean, there is uh, Shimon, like our uh, Shimon, who is our kind of like editor in. Um, yeah, so you know, it's uh, like it, uh, yeah, like to say that we are publishing it, it would be an uh, overstatement. The hidden workers behind, so you uh, you make that clear in in that uh, publication because that is, I mean, it's a quite important statement, and it would be nice if it would be performed. visible or performed. Yeah. 
We, we had a presentation in Graz last year, uh, Steirischer Herbst, and uh, Kuba at, at the um, uh, opening mentioned all the people, including pilots of the airplane that took him there and his mom who took care of him and so on. It was a sort of a performative, uh, yes, uh, it's like, you know, this is the difference between art and film. In film, you have the, uh, um, the you know, this, all these people mentioned at the, uh, at the end and sometimes it scrolls, uh, Lord of the Ring extended version, it scrolls for 15 minutes, all the people who are involved. Same for computer games. In the art field, not so much. Will be, uh, I mean, in, in a book of business, you know, you usually have everybody uh, mentioned, you know, like you have, uh, but of course there is a gradation of, of names in this sense that you have, here anyway, we had this uh, discussion about how many people to put on an editorial board, because some people did more, some people did less, so, you know, now we are five, so of course we are at the end, Kozlowski and CO, in the, of the future uh, quotations, uh, uh, so Michal is our... <coughs> that's, that, 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 that's really, you know, quite. If your if your name starts with the with the letter which is in the middle of the, of the alphabet, and still you get you get the first place, that tells a lot about in which part of the alphabet are we actually. You know? yeah. <laughs> so change your names into something like A A A A, and later your name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like we should, yeah. So we should uh, we should perform it in name like uh, A A A Kozłowski, A A A A Sova, or like A A Kurant or something like this, you know. And then of course it would be at least performing the competition of the whole uh, thing. But you know, like talking seriously, of course, uh, there are all these systems which are automatic in terms of uh, in terms of, for example. Uh, in academia, you know, like in Polish academia, Janek had this problem that like uh, publishing this kind of book, if you have like three publisher, three editors, you only get one third of points, right? Uh, there are like all these social conventions. Uh, it's not only our own choice because uh, this is a whole uh, trick of, of the kind of like systemic or like capture or like of a certain type of rankings that they do uh, encourage certain type of behavior. So it be uh, so it encourages a behavior in academia, for example. It encourages a behavior of uh, of uh, name uh, like of authoring uh, or generally of authoring individual people. There is it's a tragedy of a lo lot of cooperative artists because they uh, even though on a personal level they do like to work with others, on a personal level they also would be willing to give credits to others in terms of how they operate in a system. Uh, it is uh, very hard to, to get it by, you know, to get it through, let's say. Um, and, um, and yeah, this is, uh, yeah, so this is a, a kind of like you can create or you can kind of distribute, negotiate, uh, uh, try to make it a bit more equitable for like the most, uh, like the, the, you know, the majority of people with whom you try to work. But there are certain limits which are set by uh, uh, systemic conditions in which we in which we operate, and precisely neoliberalism is a system in which this kind of, comp uh, this kind of competitive strategies aimed at self-interest seems to be only the ones reasonable or providing some sort of means of survival in a, uh, in a short term. And this is, I think, a kind of, yeah, it's a kind of old question how to be cooperative in a competitive environment, right? And then it's a question of tragedy of the commons. I didn't speak about it, but there is all the problems related to it. <laughs>